Hello YouTube, Sidekick here. Welcome to leg three of uh, our Canada Goose cross-country flight sim vlog. We're here in Argentia, Newfoundland in our uh, Grumman Goose JRF-6. So with all those particulars out of the way, why don't we just uh, get ourselves up off the ground and we'll talk a little bit about what's on the plan for today and a little bit more about what we're doing here. So we're headed down the runway in Argentia. Get the nose down. Let's try and stay in the middle of the runway. All right, if you have not watched the first two legs of the Canada Goose uh, cross-country tour, you may want to do that. If you have, well, welcome back. As I said, we're just leaving our Gentia, Newfoundland. We flew in here at the end of our last leg to the old mil American uh, military base. Uh, currently, the airport is not used anymore except as a glider training center for air cadets. So we're heading, uh, turning, we took off roughly west. We're heading a little bit north now. And we're headed over to the Buren Peninsula which is on the far side of Placentia Bay. So that's the view down the near or uh, eastern side of Placentia Bay. And as we continue to rotate around here, the western side of Placentia Bay, which is the Buren Peninsula, is going to come into view. Now, down near the tip of the Buren Peninsula, on the other side of the peninsula, is the town of Grand Bank, which is where we're going to end the leg today. Now, this leg is actually going to be our last leg in Newfoundland. Uh, on our next leg, we're going to take off of Grand Bank. We're actually going to leave Canada briefly because we're going to take a quick look around the islands of St. Pierre and Miquelon, that actually belong to France. And then we're going to cross the Cabot Strait and we're going to go over to Cape Breton Island. But that's, that's for next time. Uh, for now, we're just going to cross over uh, the Placentia Bay to the western side to the Buren Peninsula. And so while we're doing that, uh, I'm just going to gain a little bit more altitude than usual here. I'm also uh, going to remember to actually put up the landing gear, which I had forgotten to do. And then we're just going to have to little check in the little side window back here to make sure the gear are, are up. And they are... Okay, we are now properly configured. So we get a little bit of time as we're flying over water here. Um, so uh, maybe we can talk a little bit more about Newfoundland history. Uh, one of the things that a viewer asked me after the last leg was, um, what about the history of indigenous people in Newfoundland? So uh, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, Newfoundland was a little bit different. Uh, than most parts of North America in that um, by the time of the European settlement the the Behotuk were the uh, indigenous group the only indigenous group living permanently on the island but unlike um, other native groups in at least in northeastern North America uh, the Behotuk never actually established sustained uh, trading relationships or even contact with the European settlers um, because in the, in the early times, of course, the Europeans used to come seasonally, uh, set up camps on the coast uh, to process their fish, and then they would leave every winter and go back. And gradually, some of those settlements did become permanent, but the Pihotak never uh, established permanent relationships. And one almost wonders whether or not, uh, because of the seasonal nature of the European uh, settlements, maybe they were just hoping that the Europeans would eventually go away and would argue, one would argue that for a while it was a tactic that actually worked. Okay, um, now that we're up at altitude, let's take a quick look at the map. So uh, there we are in the middle of Placentia Bay. You can see the Buren Peninsula that is locally known as the Boot, and I think you can see why. So let's just zoom in a little bit. So we're going to cross just south of these islands in the middle of the Placentia Bay, and then we're going to basically follow the coast uh, down the uh, eastern side of uh, the Buren Peninsula before we hop over to the other side. And you can see the islands there out to our right. So, as I was saying, uh, the Pihotuk strategy when the Europeans first started arriving and setting up their seasonal camps was to basically avoid contact with them and to work around their presence. 
Um, one could argue that maybe they had also um, employed a similar strategy with the Vikings when they had arrived in the northeastern tip of Newfoundland um, at a place that is now called La um, We're not exactly sure how long the Vikings lived there, but it was certain that they eventually left and did not come back. Uh, who knows, maybe that was part of the oral history of the indigenous people in Newfoundland at the time. Uh, and so really they were hoping to just outweigh the Europeans. Um, it didn't work this time, though. Uh, over the course of the 1500s, uh, and then early 1600s, Europeans began to come and stay longer and eventually set up permanent settlements on the coast. And as those uh, coastal settlements proliferated, the Bihotuk were increasingly cut off from their traditional sources of food um, until basically by the 18th century, the Bihotuk really had nowhere on the coast uh, that they could use, and they were driven inland. And eventually, um, there was violence between the Bihotuks and the settlers, um, the kind of uh, retaliatory violence that we saw in other parts of North America, uh, but in earlier centuries. And unfortunately, basically by the early 19th century, violence and starvation um, and exposure to Western diseases, including tuberculosis, had basically decimated the Bihotuk population, and um, by, for all intents and purposes, they had ceased to exist by the 1820s. Okay, you can see we've almost completed our transit across Placentia Bay here. We're just crossing uh, a beam, some islands. We just passed Red Island just to our rear. And this island off to our right-hand side now is called Marachine Island. As we come around here, you can see the uh, Buren Peninsula proper. And for those of you who prefer to track your progress uh, on the map, here's a quick look at where we are, just uh, passing Marachine Island to our right, and headed over to the boot. And you can see how the Buren Peninsula certainly got that name. So, what else should we talk about here as we uh, fly down the Buren Peninsula? I guess we had talked a little bit about uh, the history of Newfoundland, um, and had kind of gotten um, to the... Um, the end of the um, uh, Seven Years' War, the conflict between the British and the French that had such uh, long-term impacts on lots of places in North America, including Newfoundland. Uh, certainly, actually, by the end of the War of the Spanish Succession, so in the 17-teens, Newfoundland had become a British colony and the French had been evicted and had moved to Ile Royale, which we now call Cape Breton Island. Certainly by the end of the Seven Years' War, uh, the uh, English dominance in the northeastern part of North America had been established, and Newfoundland was basically firmly an English colony. Uh, now, as we all know, some of those colonies uh, became revolting, uh, as we like to say in Canada, uh, and eventually uh, uh, overthrew the British and established their own country, which is now known as the United S uh, States of America. Uh, other of the colonies stayed firmly British, including the Upper and Lower Canada and Nova Scotia, uh, but did uh, pursue uh, representation in a slightly more peaceful way than our cousins to the south. Uh, and Newfoundland uh, received a colonial assembly in 1832, uh, which is, was and still is referred to as the House of Assembly. Uh, this uh, replaced the kind of ad hoc and arbitrary system whereby naval commanders basically uh, administered the province. Um, setting up the House of Assembly also meant that Newfoundland got a permanent resident governor and an elective uh, legislature. Uh, Newfoundland remained an English colony for about another 80 years, finally acquiring uh, dominion status on the 26th of September 1907, um, along with New Zealand, which achieved it at exactly the same time. And this period of history um, is kind of known as a bit of an economic golden age uh, in Newfoundland. Newfoundland participated uh, in the First World War as a dominion of the United Kingdom. Newfoundland famously raised a regiment known as the Royal Newfoundland Regiment, but uh, in, also known as the Blue Patees for the color of the patees that they wore. These were the cloth wrappings that uh, wrapped around the lower part of the leg and the tops of the boots uh, in First World War uniforms. 
Uh, the most famous engagement of the Blue Petits uh, was during the Battle of the Somme on July the 1st, 1916. The regiment was involved in the Battle of Beaumont ML, and famously 800 Newfoundlanders uh, started the battle, and uh, less than 70 reported for roll call the next day after the first day of the Battle of the Somme. And so the Battle of the Beaumont ML is remembered every year in Newfoundland on the 1st of July. The sacrifice of the Blue Putties is also memorialized in Beaumont ML Memorial Park, which opened in France in 1925. So, as you can see, we have just about completed our crossing of Fortune Bay over to the Buren Peninsula. This is actually part of the Buren Peninsula below us right now. It's just a really long uh, promontory. So, we're going to start shaping our course a little bit here to the left. Fly down the Buren Peninsula. We're going to fly down to the town of Buren. Uh, and also the town of St. Lawrence, and then we're going to hop over to the other side, and we're actually going to end this flight on the other side of the Buren Peninsula. So, as you can see, I'm just uh, I'm flying on the gyro pilot now, I'm just using uh, the gyro pilot to actually do a nice gentle turn here to the left, and we'll get ourselves set up. One thing that's uh, kind of interesting, at least for me, uh, I noticed there's, you know, there's a fair bit of difference uh, on this side of Fortune Bay from the other side. When you look down at the land down here, uh, things are quite a bit rockier uh, than they were on the other side. The other side was fairly well forested, uh, kind of gentle landscape. Now this is a little bit starker over here on this side of the Buren Peninsula. There you can see on the inset map exactly where we are. We're headed towards Red Harbor right now. We're just going to cut across this bay here and then we'll be down the Buren Peninsula towards the town of Buren. So while we continue down the Buren Peninsula here, it's a good time to continue talking about the history of Newfoundland. Um, after the First World War, Newfoundland, like a lot of places, kind of fell on hard times, particularly during the Great Depression. Uh, prices for fish, which was really its main product and its main export, crashed, uh, which caused widespread economic disruption because, see, basically, the way the economy worked, there really wasn't a lot of subsistence farming. Uh, and so, essentially, the way the economy worked was that banks would lend fishermen money at the beginning of the fishing season to allow them to buy the supplies they needed to go fish. And then they would use the money that they made from fishing to pay back those loans. Well, when the price of fish crashed, um, a lot of those fishermen were not able to pay back the loans, which meant that a lot of the banks were not uh, able to stay uh, liquid, which basically meant they didn't have any money to lend. Uh, and so gradually fishermen w were not only struggling because the price of fish crashed, but um, increasingly it was becoming difficult to fish because there's no way to finance the fishing. Um, and basically, uh, things got so bad uh, that eventually, in return for British financial assistance, uh, the Newfoundland government uh, agreed to basically go back to being effectively a colony of Great Britain uh, with an appointed governor uh, and a six-member appointed commission of government. And this system basically actually lasted from 1934 until 1949. So, uh, at the outset of the Second World War, uh, Newfoundland was effectively uh, a colony of Great Britain. Uh, but it was very valuable uh, real estate because of its position in the North Atlantic. And so, when the United Kingdom and the United States signed the Lend-Lease Agreement, whereby the Americans lent the British some aging uh, World War I destroyers in exchange for long-term leases of uh, bases uh, on uh, British territory, uh, Argentia was one of the sites that was part of that agreement. Um, the effect of, uh, of the agreement, uh, of the influx of the Americans, was really to completely supercharge 
uh, the Newfoundland economy. Some 20,000 people were employed in the building of the military bases, and as we discussed, um, almost 10,000 American servicemen actually arrived in Newfoundland. Um, it, with the effect that actually the cost of living skyrocketed uh, in uh, Newfoundland as much as 58% between 1938 and 1945. Um, in the exposure to um, modern American population and modern American culture on a very traditional society also can't be underestimated, I think. In addition to the American servicemen at Argentia, uh, there were also a significant influ influx of uh, British and, and Canadian servicemen as well, as Sydney became uh, a major uh, stopping point and a major origin point for convoys crossing the Atlantic to Britain. So, it, you know, like a lot of places, the Second World War uh, really ended the Great Depression for Newfoundland, and by the end of the war, uh, Newfoundland was again experiencing a bit of a boom, and uh, Newfoundlanders were beginning to uh, consider what they were going to do about their effective colonial status. And so the stage was set uh, for the great debate about whether or not Newfoundland would, in fact, join Canada. All right, well, as you can see, we're working our way down the Buren Peninsula here. We still have a little bit of a ways to go today, so maybe we'll just um, fast forward the tape a little bit here and uh, see the Buren Peninsula in slightly quicker time. So we're coming up on the town of Red Harbor here, so maybe we'll slow time back down again to regular speed. Now Red Harbor is actually uh, quite a small little community. There's actually only about 180 people that live there. The interesting thing is that it was actually inhabited in the 19th century until the early 1960s uh, when there were only about half a dozen families living there. Um, and it was actually abandoned. But then the present town was created by the residents of uh, Port Elizabeth from the Flat Islands when they convinced the provincial government to relocate them uh, to Red Harbor during a resettlement program in the later 1960s. You can see it's nestled there along the river on the way out to the bay. Once again you can see that the, the land on this side of Placentia Bay is actually again quite different than it was on the Argentia side. Uh, it's a lot rockier. There's still uh, some forest, but it looks uh, looks a little bit wilder over on this side than it did uh, around Argentia and over that way. So we're turning back uh, south again along uh, the Buren Peninsula. Uh, so maybe it's time to just hit the fast forward button here again a little bit as we make our way down to Buren. Alright, so we're coming into the town of Buren, so we can uh, slow things down again. Uh, it's, it's referred to as the town of Buren, but actually it's an amalgamation of several different communities around the various uh, uh, parts of the coastline here. As you can see, it's a, uh, 
offers a lot of uh, uh, various very protected anchorages, which is why uh, it, like uh, a lot of the settlements along the coast of Newfoundland, was settled in the uh, 16th and 17th century. Um, and this part of Newfoundland, again, was particularly settled by the French, um, mostly seasonally, but gradually communities grew up that became more permanent, and uh, Buron was one of those, uh, part, particularly because it offered such, uh, such a wide variety uh, of places uh, where boats could be pulled up securely and lots of different places to uh, to dry fish and engage in all of the activities that the seasonal fishermen uh, engaged in uh, when they were in Newfoundland. So, as we're coming south here to the uh, town of St. Lawrence, which has a very interesting story that I want to talk about, uh, maybe we should just complete um, our story about Newfoundland uh, history, or at least Newfoundland pre-Canadian history. So at the end of the Second World War, and the Newfoundland economy uh, was booming, and Newfoundlanders were very interested in uh, moving on from their status effectively as a British colony. Um, but the decision was, um, what would Newfoundland decide to do? And there were actually three options. One was to go back to being a Dominion, as they had been from 1907 until 1934. The second option was to join Canada and become a province of uh, Canada, but there was actually a third option, which was uh, to potentially uh, see if they could join the United States. Now, the third option um, was very popular among some people in Newfoundland because, of course, there had been a very large uh, American presence in Newfoundland, and Newfoundland had always had a strong trading relationship with the Boston states as they were referred to, and, and still are by some people in that part of the country. Uh, now, that third option um, was not exactly popular uh, with either the British or the Canadian governments. Uh, as you can imagine, the thought, especially for the Canadian government, of having uh, another state of uh, the United States uh, squarely in the middle of the Gulf of St. Lawrence uh, was not exactly uh, a popular option. And so uh, the British and the Canadian governments basically conspired to make sure that the only two options that were on the referendum for uh, Newfoundland independence was whether it would become a province of Canada or whether it would go back to being a dominion on its own. Now, the um, referendum was held in 1949, People, uh, Canadians in particular, uh, may forget that the results were actually very, very close. Only about 52.5% of the population voted to become a Canadian province, with 47.5% uh, of the population uh, voting to actually become an independent dominion. But nonetheless, a majority of the population voted to be for Newfoundland to become a province of Canada, and so it did. And so it has been. Uh, for better or for worse, for the last 70-odd years. All right, so we are continuing our trip down the Buren Peninsula here and coming up on the town of St. Lawrence, uh, which has an interesting story associated with it, dating from the time of the Second World War. It's the story of the USS Truxton. It's also a story, a very interesting story, about the meeting uh, of two different worlds. The USS Truxton was a U.S. destroyer that actually foundered in a storm in February of 1942. Many of the crew were killed, but some did survive, including a man named Lanier Phillips. Now, Lanier Phillips was black, and uh, he is quoted as saying that before he was shipwrecked uh, in Newfoundland, he had, and I quote, I had never heard a kind word from a white man in my life because he had come from the deep south in the United States. Similarly, um, the people of St. Lawrence, uh, Newfoundland, had actually never uh, seen a black man. And so um, Phillips washed up on the shore and was uh, rescued uh, by the local inhabitants and he woke up uh, to find a local woman who was scrubbing his skin raw because she thought that he was actually covered in oil and she was trying to get his skin to go back to being white. Once that little misunderstanding was out of the way, the uh, local woman, whose name was Violet Pike, insisted that Phillips come to her home with her, where she nursed him and put him in bed with blankets and rocks that she'd warmed in her wood stove. 
Phillips was profoundly touched and changed by the kindness of the residents of St. Lawrence, Newfoundland, and he went on to become the Navy's first black sonar technician, and he vowed to do everything in his power to repay the kindness he'd experienced. Eventually, he donated enough money to St. Lawrence for them to build a children's playground. It's fair to say that his interaction with the uh, residents of St. Lawrence, Newfoundland, not only saved Lanier Phillips' life, but changed it forever. He went on to become an activist, an anti-discrimination activist in the United States, and in fact was awarded an honorary degree from uh, Memorial University of Newfoundland in 2008 for his efforts. In 2011, he was given an honorary membership in the Order of Newfoundland and Labrador for his work in civil rights. In 2012, uh, a play about Lanier's experience called Oil and Water uh, was produced by Newfoundland's Artistic Fraud Theatre Company. And the story of Lanier Phillips is moderately famous in Newfoundland. I can tell you from personal experience that if you uh, say to just about any of your Newfoundland um, acquaintances, uh, if you say the words beer and peninsula, they will probably uh, raise the story of Lanier Phillips in the USS Truxton. So, we are just passing over the town of St. Lawrence now, and we're getting ready to cross the Buren Peninsula over to the other side, the Fortune Bay side of the peninsula, and from there we're going to find a place to put down for the day. So, I think it's probably a good time again to just uh, wind the clock forward a little bit, and we'll just uh, skip over flying over the peninsula, and... Uh, pick up the trip as we come around on the other side. Alright, so here we are coming out on the Fortune Bay side of the Buren Peninsula. You can see down to our left the town of Grand Bank, which is probably where we're actually going to uh, put down for the evening. So we'll just take a few minutes here and enjoy a look at the Fortune Bay side of the Buren Peninsula. So I should point out that the Buren is actually not part of the Avalon Peninsula, which is where we started over in St. John. It's actually part of the mainland of Newfoundland. The other interesting thing to note about this side of the Buren Peninsula is, again, we've kind of seen a change uh, in the landscape. Uh, on the other side, on the Placentia Bay side, uh, things were pretty rocky, maybe a little bit boggy. On this side, um, it looks like the terrain is a lot less, I don't know, uh, forbidding. It looks like there's even a few uh, rocky or sandy beaches down there. Uh, overall, it looks like uh, just a little bit more pleasant place to live. And, in fact, the larger communities on the Buren Peninsula are on this side, including the town of Grand Bank that you can see coming up ahead on the left there. So as we fly by Grand Bank, we'll just take a look to see if we can see a place that might look like a good place for us to come in and land. And we're going to go by Grand Bank and down to the town of Fortune, which is another uh, substantial community on this side of the Bureau. And then there's a couple of things about Fortune that I wanted to uh, take a look to talk about. Yeah, it looks like that's basically all beach down there, or at least not very rocky. So, as I said, this is going to be our last trip uh, in Newfoundland, last leg of the trip in Newfoundland. The Canada Goose is heading out to Nova Scotia on the next leg. Before we do that, though, we'll take a, make a small international uh, detour. Well, it's not really a detour because it's on the way, but we'll take a look at the islands of St. Pierre and Miquelon in the next leg. Oh, well, there's the town of Grand Bank. Oh, it looks like it has a lovely pier right there, just where the, uh, the river lets out into the bay. That looks like an excellent place to land and go see, uh, see the town of Grand Bank. Now, as I said, we're just going to push on a little bit further here. Uh, and go um, take a look at the Town of Fortune, because the Town of Fortune is uh, important for, uh, well, not really historical reasons, but for prehistorical reasons. Uh, for most of its history, Fortune, like most other communities along 
uh, the shores of Newfoundland was mainly known uh, as a fishing village. Uh, but in 1977, a very important discovery was made, uh, and it was a fossil. Um, and it took many years of studies and field trips by scientists, but eventually it was discovered um, that f the geology of Fortune was very special because it was known as a global stratotype. Uh, essentially, it was found that um, the rocks around Fortune um, form a reference point for the boundary between the Precambrian and Cambrian time periods. And um, there are very few sites like this in the world, and so uh, Fortune is actually the first of these sites to be discovered in North America. Uh, it's actually said that um, the area around Fortune contains more trace fossils than basically anywhere else in the world. Trace fossils are um, the hardened remains of animal tracks, such as worm burrows, um, and they indicate the presence of prehistoric life forms. Uh, prehistoric life forms from 540 million years ago. So if you visit the town of Fortune today, you can go to the Fortune Head Ecological Reserve where you can hike and look at the cliffs that represent this uh, important geological boundary, or you can also visit the Fortune Head Geology Center, um, which includes uh, a large collection of fossils that have been found in the Fortune area. So that's the town of Fortune down there, uh, an interesting uh, place to visit on the very tip of the Buren Peninsula. So uh, I think it's just about time that we go find a place uh, to land. So we're going to turn back towards uh, the town of Grand Bank and I think we're going to put down uh, next to that pier that we took a look at. So we're going to go basically back into our landing mode here. Come back around and down the coast. It's definitely a more hospitable looking coast down there on this side of the Buren Peninsula than around uh, Buren and St. Lawrence on the other side. So once again, thank you for joining me on this third leg of the Canada Goose Cross Country Tour. As I said in our uh, the next installment, we'll actually be leaving Newfoundland. Um, we're going to take a quick tour around the islands of St. Pierre and Miquelon, and then we're going to head over to Cape Breton in Nova Scotia. Um, it's the uh, So far, the first three lakes have taken me a while to uh, get out uh, over the summer, but I'm expecting to pick up the pace um, and uh, have quite a few more episodes more quickly. Uh, if I don't, we'll never get across the country. So, uh, as you can see, we're going into landing mode. We're pulling back the power a little bit for those of you who are interested in the flight part of this uh, flight simulation experience. We're just going to do a quick uh, base leg uh, over across over to the harbor, and then we're just going to take, uh, take her down and settle in uh, right next to probably uh, to the wharf there. Just check and make sure, yep, the wheels are up. We don't want to be landing on the water with the wheels down. That won't work very well. And we'll pull back the speed down just a little bit so we can get the flaps to come down here soon and we'll get ourselves turned on the base here in just a sec still a reasonably calm day so I don't anticipate any problem landing on the ocean our trusty goose seems to be serving us well so far on this uh, cross-country trip Still lots of places to go and lots of things to see, so I hope you continue to turn in, tune in to the Cross Canada Vlog. We got the flaps down, but we're still going a little too fast for them to come down. Now, on the Goose, you can throw the switch at whatever uh, airspeed you want. Um, the flaps are basically spring-loaded. They just don't come down until you're going slow enough. You got a little bit of wave action going on down there. So now we're getting down nice and slow finish our turn on to our final approach here. You get a nice look at the shoreline as we're doing that.
and we'll just level ourselves out here. Actually, don't need to come down quite this far from town, so we'll extend things out a little bit here, a little bit farther. Until we're ready to drop into the water. And there we are. Oops, a little bit of a bounce. Get ourselves down. Welcome to Grand Bank, everyone. Our last stop uh, in Newfoundland on the Canada Goose Cross Country Tour. We'll pick it up here next time. Thanks for joining me. As always, this is going to be Sidekick. Signing off.